Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to continue our conversation with Dr. Janice Johnson, author of Convicting the Mormons. This time we're going to get into the trials of John D. Lee, including the execution. We've got some really cool photos and illustrations of people who were there, so you won't want to miss this episode. We'll also talk about how especially the first trial was uh, really important for turning public opinion against the Mormons and charging Brigham Young with a conspiracy in the murder. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Now, is that a result of, uh, I'm going to say, a bad policy of Brigham? Because as the Utah War, which I think a lot of people, especially the general public, don't really understand very well. I mean, in 1857, President Buchanan sent an army to Utah to put down the quote-unquote Mormon Rebellion. Yeah. Um, And so... Brigham Young, in response to this, said, okay, well, all immigration through Utah needs to stop. I'm going to prove to them, if they don't have the Mormons on their side, that this trail is dangerous. And he kind of encouraged Mormons and Indians to attack immigrants, and especially to steal their cattle. Yeah. So how much blame... I mean, it, it, to me, it looks like Brigham's like, well, I'm going to prove that if they don't have the Mormons here, it's going to be dangerous. But didn't that backfire on him? Was that a was that a bad strategy? I, well, I would say it definitely backfired on him. But I think that, um, I mean, Rick and Barbara's book, The Vengeance is Mine, is going to m- more specifically go into this. Um, but in my book, I look at how this perception of Mormon and Indian alliance is long before. I mean, you have when the saints are in winter quarters in Iowa and you have rumors that Mormons and Indians are getting together and then they're going to massacre all the white um, settlers on the frontier. That's... It seems like it even goes back to Missouri. You know, 15 years before... um, Mount Meadows. Okay. You so have the, these kind of, you've got these kind of rumors going on. And so you could make an argument that Brigham actually helps that be fulfilled. Okay. Um, but, but you have rumors of stuff like this long before Mount Meadows ever happens. Does he so Mount some, Meadows gives you evidence of that. Does he bear some blame for, I mean, maybe you want to call it negligence or something for creating this environment? that made it worse? I mean, again, this is, that's, that's not my, that's not my specialty and that's not my focus. I'm focused on what's going on outside. And, um, it did contribute to outside perceptions though. Yeah, no, it did. It did contribute to outside perceptions and that, and that relationship with Brigham is constantly is trying to be allied with the native peoples, um, but it never works as well as he wants it to. And in some instances, it goes horrifically wrong. Um, and we see different, over time, we see Brigham Young with different policies on um, how they should deal with the Native peoples. But um, of course it's going to go wrong. You're still massacring Native peoples. Like, you're never going to get a complete alliance with people who you have massacred yourself. That's that's never going to be completely um, use, uh, useful to him because they haven't been consistent with how they have, have treated Native peoples. Is it the only card that he could have played <laughs> to, to, to try to John, stop Johnston's army to, from coming? I mean, was he really out of options and he just did the best he could? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> it's not my thing. <laughs> All right. So the first trial uh, results in a hung jury. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm trying to remember pretty much. All the Mormons voted to acquit all the, or one? We don't actually know okay. how how that goes. Um, there are some reports that say all the Mormons voted to acquit and all the non-Mormons voted to convict. 
Um, but we have a couple of reports, and we don't we don't know specifically how it goes, but we know it's deadlocked and there it's a hung jury. Okay. Um, so, so that results in a retrial. It results in a retrial. So the next year we'll come to trial again. By this time, we've got a new U.S. attorney, Sumner Howard, um, who just wants a conviction and is actually concerned with convicting Lee. Okay. Um, and, and so the second trial is going to go much faster. Now, Lee still has the same attorney, uh, W.W. Bishop, William Bishop, and um, he puts up absolutely no defense. They don't call a single defense witness. I think he, you said in your book that Bishop was guilty of legal malpractice. I well, I don't know that I make it that, but I, you could make. I think you could make that argument. He doesn't put up a defense. Now his, his in his own defense, he's going to say, "Oh well, there were all these technicalities. There were all these problems that would have that we didn't need to." Uh, that those those things could have caused it to be overturned later. And so, and I don't know if that's just trying, if those none of those things would work. Now, of course, the way the territorial system is set up is that you have district, federal district judges, and they all come together and form the territorial Supreme Court. And so to get something overturned, you're if still going back to the same judge. You're going back to, he's just one of three now, but it was still Judge Borman who was the one who who um, convicted him in the first place. So so that's a hard so. sell. <laughs> um, uh, I, I guess Bishop wasn't getting paid either. He's not. He's uh, not for, getting for paid. Trial? Did he get paid for the first one? Or I no? think he got paid for the first one because he doesn't seem to be so concerned with the first one. But, um, but he did offer a defense in the first trial. He did offer a defense, and it was and and the first trial is much more lengthy, and and that could be another reason why he just doesn't do much with the second trial. Because he's not getting paid. Because he's not getting paid, um, and then you've got them trying to appeal um, bids for clemency. Um, that all is going to take time and. Uh, and Bishop is just not into it. So he's consistently asking Lee to write his memoirs because Bishop thinks everybody actually involved in this thinks that they can make money off of this. OJ, if I did it, right? Yeah. So <laughs> you've got, so Judge Borman is, um, is the federal judge who uh, is over the trial he wants to, he actually hires someone to make a transcript of the first trial because he wants to sell it. Oh, he so wants to publish wants to it. Make money on this. You have uh, Lockley, Fer Frederick Lockley, who's a Tribune reporter. He actually writes a romance. It's called something called, there's a copy of it in the Huntington Library in California. Um, it's like a swashbuckler's romance. Oh. And romance in the 19th century is, you know, um, it's a, it's an adventure. It's, um, anyway, and you're going to get lots of mountain meadows stories like this, but, but a Bishop wants to publish Lee's memoirs. And so he keeps encouraging him and, and the kind of arrangement, like I've done all of this for you. So I need your, your memoirs. So that I can make money to get paid for the trial yeah. that I'm not getting paid for. Exactly. So, um, when he visits him in jail before his um, execution, he's only he hasn't even on his memoirs hadn't even gotten to Utah yet, so he's concerned he's not gonna get to Utah. Um, so he encourages him to kind of fast forward a little and skip forward in his memoirs. <laughs> we need the Mount Meadows, not all the other yeah. stuff. Yeah, and then after um, Lee's, uh, so Lee is going to there are going to be two. Confessions, two final confessions that Lee gives. Well, one, but two versions of it will be published in the papers. One that comes through Sumner Howard and one that comes through Bishop, Lee's attorney. And the one that comes through Bishop um, has been altered and highly edited 
um, along with those confessions, those memoirs that Lee writes, um, to directly implicate Brigham Young. Okay. And um, and Sumner so, Howard was the prosecuting attorney, so right? He's the U.S. attorney. He's the prosecuting attorney. Um, and people are going to battle over which one's the right one. So what did um, Sumner Howard say? Well, Sumner uh, Howard, I mean, and he's being accused of malpractice. Like there are all sorts of of things going on at this even the though same he got a time. conviction yeah um that there's um i'm trying to remember what the the specific accusation of it is um at the time but there's there's a lot of stuff going on um newspapers are going to battle over which one's the right one with bishop saying his is right and howard saying his is right so in howard's case it didn't implicate Brigham Young, and so that's why people rejected it? Yeah. Well, I mean, some, they both get money for publishing them. <laughs> um, Bishop is going to eventually publish all of the memoirs, but they, and they've been highly edited. Um, I think if, Barbara told me that they were so edited that they didn't feel... Like they could use them in vengeance is mine. Yeah, but it was that um, unreliable. So when when it's pu- and they know when it's published, so the Ogden Standard in their review of it when it's published, they title it "A Little Lee, A Little Lawyer." <laughs> so it's very like bit and like getting things wrong, like a calling Lee a bishop. He's never been a bishop, but in these stories about Mountain Meadows. And in Lee's confessions, he's called a bishop. Right. Um, as is Isaac Haight, as is all sorts of people who were supposed to be on the massacre field. They're now, all bishops? They're all bishops. Sons of bishops. <laughs> it, except for Klingensmith, who is the bishop. <laughs> no, so he's, he's not, a not called a bishop <laughs> because he's left the church by this time. Oh. But the title bishop has the full weight of anti-hierarchical, well, the Catholic anti-Catholicism, yeah. and which is a really heavy, it does a lot of work in the 19th century. And when you think of a Catholic bishop, that's a big wig. Right. So, Probably a bigger big wig than it is in the LES church. So they're using that, that title to try and bring all sorts of weight to these, to these accusations. Mm. Um, Mormons and Catholics are often kind of pictured in some of the very similar ways. You have in, in your book, century. I don't know if you can show it, but there's a picture of Catholicism and the Mormon church attacking the U.S. Capitol. I yeah. Remember. Let's see if I can find. <laughs> Christina Rossetti mentioned it, and I was like, oh, I know that's in Janice's book. <laughs> yeah. So it's rather small, but okay. there, yeah, there are these two. Um, you've got... Yeah, a turtle, snapping turtle, maybe some sort of vicious turtle, and a crocodile climbing up the two sides of the Capitol Rotunda. And it says um, that something about, I I can't even read it, I don't have my glasses on, but that (laughs) we won't let these reptiles crawl all over us. But one is the Mormon church, and um, the other uh, represents the, the Catholics. Right. Um, so, yeah. You'd so, think Mormons and Catholics would stick together, but it doesn't really happen that way. <laughs> you get a few moments um, when a Catholic convent is burned in, um, when the saints are in Nauvoo, Joseph Smith's going to speak out against that. Oh, okay. Um, but, yeah, you don't, you don't see much, um, much allegiance. Right. The 1877 trial results in conviction. 1876, but it, yes, it results in a conviction. Okay. And then 1877 is when he's executed. Right. It's not this 20-year gap like it is for our current day. No. I think one of the most remarkable, and I can't remember if it's a painting or a photo, is John D. Lee sitting on his coffin preparing to be executed. Yeah. So it's a photo. It's um, and it's in the prologue here, but um, and then we also get engravings of it later on. So at Lee's execution, so the photo is published on a cabinet card, so you can buy it as a keepsake. Wow. Um, there are after Lee's execution, 
Um, so Frank Leslie's Illustrated magazine does a whole special supplemental issue that is just on Lee's execution. And they have all of these engravings which are done, which are based on some of the photographs. They can't yet replicate photographs in newspapers, so they have to do engravings. But you have like live action shots. You have Lee falling back into his ca- his into his coffin and bullets coming, right. you know, at him. Um, well, but, his famous last words are, "Aim true, boys. Don't make me suffer." That's something to that effect. I remember. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even. I didn't. I didn't put it. I didn't put that. I didn't put it in. Yeah, (laughs) but um, he. um, It becomes this, you know, and it's the same sort of morbid fascination with public executions. This one wasn't public. They actually tried to keep it from the public. But it was at Mountain Meadows. It was. They brought him back to, and other than people getting lynched, and. Bringing, bringing a lynching victim back to their, the place of their crime, I don't see any precedent for this. But they bring him back to the Mountain Meadows. They mm-hmm. bring crime and punishment together. Um, and it seems that they want to, they're still wanting him for, to give them a full confession. Implicating and Brigham Young. Implicating Brigham Young. And, and he won't do it. He won't, he won't do it. He is as much as he's mad at Brigham and he is upset that Brigham hasn't protected him. He thinks Brigham's given him up. Um, but he, he won't pin it on Brigham because Brigham didn't order it. Can you address this rumor that I've heard, um, that the first trial Brigham Young tried to protect John D. Lee and the second trial, it was like, well, we need a sacrificial lamb. We're, we're going to let it go this time. Because um, the second jury was an all-Mormon jury. Yeah. Well, and Howard says, okay. And he he does work with LDS church leaders, but not, quite, not, not kind of as orchestrated as, and that's what some of the accusations of right. him later is that, and that's what this Howard versus Gilman, this, these accusations of, malfeasance is that he has allied himself with Brigham Young and it's a U.S. Marshal who's making some of these accusations. Um, But Howard is playing nice with Brigham, but he's not, he hasn't, he's still fully intending to continue these prosecutions. He's, he is not thinking that this is it. So he's still going to go after hate and dame. He is going to go after hate and dame and, um, I mean, Kling and Smith turned state's evidence. Were they ever going to go after him? Well, Kling and Smith, when he testifies in the first trial, so when he gives his affidavit in 1871, Bates, who was the U.S. attorney at that time, gives him a, a, a um, noli prosequi is the, is the legal term, but it is that we, uh, it's a promise we won't convict you because he's been indicted for the same thing. Um, and... He doesn't want to go testify in John D. Lee's trial. He doesn't. He they have a they have to chase him down to bring him in to testify, and he is. It's kind of a riveting moment because he is grasping on this piece of paper, which seems to be this order that they wouldn't convict him. He is very worried about testifying and that he's going to be convicted. Because Klingon Smith knows he's also guilty. Yeah. And he was he was there from the beginning. He supported hate in hate's original move to try and get um, the council at Cedar City to get behind it, to go out and attack the immigrants. Um, Klingon Smith supported him all along the way and was, unlike hate, was actually on the massacre field. And so Klingon Smith's freaked out. Um, he has just kind of, he has gone off to um, Nevada. He's trying to keep himself scarce. Sometimes he's in California. He's, um, yeah, he's kind of all, all over the place. But he seems very fearful that, because his indictment hasn't officially been dropped. Okay. So Sumner Howard theoretically was going to go after all these. Why didn't he? 
Um, he 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 has some. El Wilden is in jail for a while, as is um, George Adair. Um, they and they just wait, and then nothing. I I I mean, they are there at the massacre. They are participants, but they are not the reason the massacre happened. They're not the ringleaders. They're not the ringleaders. Well, Damon so, Hate were the ringleaders. Yeah, and. Um, I mean, I, I'd say Hate and Lee. That's my, my, oh, really? my I would say. More would, than Dame? Well, Dame lets it happen, but he doesn't encourage it. Was Dame, because I'm trying to remember, was Dame the senior most military leader? Yeah. Okay. So, so Hate and Lee were kind of like pushing this. Dame didn't stop it. Hate has to get permission from um, Dame. From Dame. But and they go to the council at Parowan to try and get that, and the council again shuts him down. And it's not until he goes around the council and just goes to Dame. They, that's what we call the Tanbark Council. But they spent the night talking, and that's when he believe he leaves. Later, Dame's not gonna. Dame's gonna say, "I didn't tell him to do it," but Hate leaves thinking that he has Dame's permission. Um, he's got the okay from from Dame. Okay, and that's that. Uh, Hate and Lee, and of course, everybody. You can't trust what anyone says about their own participation. <laughs> you can kind of triangulate what they say about other people and fit that all together, but you can't completely trust what anyone says about themselves. Hmm. Interesting. So. So Lee's executed in 1877, 20 mm -hmm. years after the massacre. Um, Mountain Meadows continues to live on. I mean, I th it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it seems like the LDS church especially tried to bury it until Juanita Brooks came out with it. Um, was it ever buried bet between those? It's never completely buried. It keeps coming up. So even after statehood in 1890, um, you has you start getting more fictional stories that bring up Sherlock so, Holmes. Or um, there was an episode where Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, talked about so the, the Scarlet Letter talks about Mormons. Um, so you get Abraham Gash, who was uh, I, I'm trying to remember if he's a federal attorney, but he has some federal position in Utah. Um, writes a novel about with Mountain Meadows at the so the the heart of this is a little girl who's supposed to be one of the orphans mm -hmm. who is left at Mountain Meadows and um, she is adopted by a Mormon family and never gets sent back to Arkansas with the other Mormons. Well, there that was are a lots rumor. of lots of those stories that are perpetuated. Um, but he's gonna uh, write a novel. Um, so with Bancroft's history in, I think it's published in like in the late 1890s, you're going to get kind of the first kind of more historical view of Mountain Meadows. Um, when we get to the, the 1930s, you've had the Reed Smoot trials, which again, all the Mountain Meadows stuff is going to be dragged up in the press. It's only going to show up in the congressional testimony as kind of a last ditch effort. Reed Smoot was the early 1900s, like 1904. 1904 to seven. Right. So it's three. It's three years. Um, a senator from Tennessee is going to bring up Mountain Meadows just at the very end as kind of a last ditch effort. But you've got a new publication um, of John D. Lee's Confessions. Um, you've got Wild West shows that show Mountain Meadows that, like, senators could go for entertainment at night. Um, you get have this League of Women Voters who publish this copy, who um, give the funding to publish this new copy of John D. Lee's Confessions. And um, the, the guy who publishes it, his introduction, it's the same story we've heard before. He says, I had to... Um, I had to sneak two copies of this out of Utah. <laughs> um, and, you know, people should know this happened. No one's heard of it. There have been dozens of editions so since 1877. Are trying to keep this alive. But, 
you know, um, but he says, I had to, you all need to know this. Nobody knows this, you know, and you need to, you need to know this. We get the same. I mean, even when we go forward to like 2007 with September Dawn, the woman who wrote the screenplay for it says something very similar, like no one knows about this. And this tells you everything you need to know about the Mormons. Well, and of course, recently we have Under the Banner of Heaven. Yeah. Um, which obviously talks about Mountain Meadows as well. And the author tries to tie that to the Lafferty murders, right? Mormons yeah. are just, they have a violent history. They're always violent. And so this continues. So it's hard to say that Mountain, I guess Mountain Meadows probably started the violent streak in Mormons or I don't know, maybe the Missouri War. But there, there are rumors of it before then. You know, there are rumors of connecting Mormons with violence before then, but this um, certainly galvanizes, galvanizes it. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so can you, can you talk a little bit about Under the Banner of Heaven? So the book comes out in 2003. I think it's 2003. It's, um, it is um, still, if you look on Amazon, it is often the bestseller in Mormonism. Um, I think that um, Vengeance is Mine uh, overtook Under the Banner of Heaven Hallelujah. at least maybe once. <laughs> but um, it is, yeah, it is consistently, um, and he is trying to uh, write in the wake of 9-11 um, he is trying to write about the dangers of religious extremism specifically. Um, and he's going to say to try and avoid those claims that he's being racist. If he's talking about Muslim extremism, he goes for Mormon extremism. <laughs> and um, but his his larger argument, Krakow's larger argument is that religion opens up the possibility for extremism. Therefore, religion is bad. Um, that's not a particularly nuanced argument about <laughs> religion because, um, I don't know, football, soccer can also cause extremism and cause people to be violent and to do horrific, violent things. Um, you didn't say hockey. <laughs> hockey it just happens while they're playing it. Um, but... Um, we've, we, when we get to the TV show, so, so this story is going to endure. And then the t TV show, this is actually the final thing that I talk about in my book is under the banner of heaven. It's the limited series that was, um, uh, produced on Netflix last, last year. Right. So I no, actually, it was on Hulu, I think was it was on. Yeah, you're yeah. right. It was on Hulu. Um, I watched the final episode of that and then wrote my last paragraph. Oh, really? And sent off my manuscript. Oh, no way. Yeah. So, um, and Krakauer's book looks almost nuanced compared to the TV show. Oh, really? Um, Krakauer's book is not nuanced, but the TV show takes a very heavy hand and leans into a lot of controversies, a lot of rumors, um, but it, it argues, um, it takes Krakauer's argument in a different direction. It is just very focused on Mormonism, and it is that Mormonism produces dangerous men, that this is what Mormonism is. And so some of the elements of that haven't changed at all since the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Um most of us aren't really so concerned with establishing white civilization right now. I think there are some people who are <laughs> concerned with that still. Um, but yet the story is malleable enough that even though that kind of structure and that discourse of white civilization has changed, the Mountain Meadows story is still malleable for whatever you want it to be. Um, and these stories don't yield any new information about Mountain Meadows. They actually tell us more about the people who are writing them than they do about the massacre itself. That is something that is um, worthy of our study that we need to better understand. And we've, we've seen lots of 
uh, work done, good work done to try and better understand the, the horror of Mountain Meadows as a historical event. Um, but the way the story has been used doesn't give us more information about that. It tells us about these places where um, Mormonism breaches boundaries of um, whether it's people thinking about Protestantism or Americanness or white civilization. It's it the story becomes used to show these places where Mormonism crosses these these limits. Um, whether it's 19th century or 21st century. Hmm. So I know, so it seems like a lot of the anti-Mormonism that is still present really, I mean, can we tie it all the way back to Mountain Meadows? A lot of it. I mean, we're going to see a lot of these, these narratives still. Um, and yeah, it's, I, I mean, there are some, some very direct threads um, that, that we're going to see, we're going to continue to see. I know at your book signing at Benchmark Books oh, a few weeks ago, a month ago probably, um, there was, right at the very end, there was one very pointed question. Uh, and I, if I remember right, it was something like, did Brigham Young do it? Or is he responsible? <laughs> How, how was, did I get the question right? And how would you respond to that question, even if I didn't? Um, <laughs> I don't remember. There were a couple people with kind of pointed questions about mm. about the massacre itself, right? Um, not and and it is hard. I mean, people want to talk about the massacre. People still want to talk about the massacre. And so when I kind of say my book is not actually about the massacre, <laughs> it's about how the story of the massacre was used over time. And um, but but again, for for people who believe that Brigham Young ordered the massacre, if you are really tied into that belief then evidence isn't really going to sway you. Um, but, I mean, Massacre at Mountain Meadows gave us, Will Bagley always thought that there was a smoking gun. Right. But his smoking gun was Brigham Young meeting with um, Native leaders on the 1st of September. And Massacre at Mountain Meadows showed that the, early, the, the first of those leaders that Brigham Young met with to leave Salt Lake left on the 8th of September. And the, the, the process that led to the massacre was already well underway on the, 7th. On, on the 8th of September. Yeah. And so, I think the 7th was when the first guy got shot, right? Yeah. So, and you've got days before that that are leading up to this. So you have to, I mean, besides the fact that you know, we can drive to Cedar City. We can drive to Mount Meadows in three and a half hours today. Right. Um, but you From need Salt to Lake. ride out. Yeah, you need to ride out full flat out on a horse, on multiple horses for 36 hours in 1857 to get any sort of word right. um, to, to Cedar City. And that were pre-telegraph. And, and so you have to believe in all sorts of conspiracies to think that this, that Brigham Young ordered the massacre. But there are those who still are going to hold very tight to, to that belief. And evidence isn't going to change their mind. And evidence isn't going to change their mind. Have you, did you have an opportunity to review Barbara and Richard's book? So I, um, I, they sent to me uh, four or five chapters of the book that I reviewed in the in the process and that was the trial stuff yeah or, okay yeah well that's funny because richard's a lawyer yeah <laughs> yes but i was the general editor on the legal papers so and and some of and some of rick's legal training may lead to some of our different assessments of, oh. of some of the things that happened in the trial but what, now i'm curious what are the different assessments well he he they they argue that 
that from the beginning of John D. Lee's trial that they didn't want a conviction. The first trial. The first trial. Um, I, I don't think it's quite that planned. Oh. Um, Frederick Lockley, who is the Tribune reporter and very in with, very close to Baskin, who has just at the last minute is appointed as an assistant U.S. attorney so he can help try this case. Um, Lockley writes a letter to his wife right at, towards the end of the trial and says, it seems really weird that we don't really want a conviction. And, and so that seems to say to me that this isn't like a fully fleshed out plan that they don't want a conviction. But, but this is kind of how, how the trial proceeds. Would you say that the government prosecution in the first trial was incompetent? Um, I think that they have different, I think their goals are to pin it on Brigham and to pin it on the church. Um, and, but, but it didn't seem like they cared about convicting Lee. I, yeah, and I, I kind of, I mean, they know he's guilty and he is guilty. And so I think that they just assume, I don't know. I mean, part of it, some of the arguments that they make, and, and I think that this is part of what takes Rick to say this was the plan all along, because they're making arguments to the Latter-day Saint members of the jury that if they just throw off their Mormonism, they can fix this for everybody. It's not really a convicting, a, a convincing argument for faithful Latter Day Saints. Um, they make, uh, they argue to them that they just need to be men, and throw off their allegiance to a prophet. I guess there were no women on the jury. And no, there are no women on the jury, <laughs> though there are women present, and sometimes that that becomes an issue when they. <coughs> excuse me. Um, talk about. Uh, sensational or titillating things. Um, but uh, yeah, but they, they're making arguments that seem to be more for the press and for the newspapers than they're ever actually for the jury. Well, I can see why Rick would argue that they wanted a hung jury anyway. Well, there, but there are also... There are lots of kind of missteps. Like it is not a well organized trial, which is the other thing that I I think kind of well, leads to that. But I mean, it does lead to the question. You know, um, nobody was convicted of the murder of Joseph Smith, and when the Mormons went to trial, a lot of times in Missouri, they didn't get convicted either. <laughs> Was the whole legal system just incompetent? Well, in the 19th I mean, century? I mean, that's that's one of the things that I argue. Like, um, people talk about the lack of a prosecution and the lack of a conviction, other than Lee. But the fact that Lee was white and was convicted of a crime in the 19th was convicted of a massacre in the 19th century actually makes him different. Hmm. I mean, you have. Um, one of the, one of the potential parallels would be um, John Brown and the Potawatomi massacre. Um, you have whites attacking other whites and killing other whites. John Brown is not convicted for the Potawatomi massacre. John Brown isn't convicted until Harper's Ferry. Okay. Um, and and so you have. Um, you have Indian combatants um, who are convicted, but very rarely do you have white combatants who are convicted. Well, even of, Harley of Pratt's murderer, something named a, he was a justified hom homicide, so he got off too. Yeah. So, I mean, it just makes you wonder about the legal system. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, they couldn't convict anybody. They well, couldn't convict a ham sandwich. <laughs> well, but, and 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 you've got yeah juries who aren't, and that's and that's one of their arguments against the Mormons is that Mormons will never convict other Mormons. Which um, the second trial proved wrong. Yeah, the second trial was a, a statement against that. Hmm. Anything we're missing on this? I don't know. We talked about lots of things. <laughs> 
Um, but I yeah, do, I what? do have to ask you about that uh, sign just behind you. Votes for women. Yeah, I think you've been involved in some of the because Utah. This is where I always get messed up. Utah was the first territory. Wyoming was the first state to allow women to vote. Is that right? Sure. <laughs> Are um, you involved? Wyoming in Wyoming like passes that? it first, but you in Utah they vote first. I think that's what it is. Okay. Um, I have been really interested in the Better Days 2020 um, in in the good work that they've been doing. I haven't been directly involved in it. Okay. But um, but suffrage is. Um, is a topic that I enjoy. <laughs> Are there any other topics you're working on? Um, I am working on, I say working, I haven't gotten a lot. I just finished a book, um, a manuscript, a brief theological introduction to Revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants. Okay. So that's a very different kind of book. Yeah, um, no murder but in that one. The Maxwell Institute did, uh, for the Book of Mormon, did these brief theological introductions, and they had one volume on each book. Um, we're doing it again for the Doctrine and Covenants, but they're thematic this time. And so I'm looking at Revelation. Okay. Um, and, and then I have this continuing book project on the early reception history of the Book of Mormon. Um, so how the earliest... Um, Latter-day Saints were converted to the Book of Mormon, how they used the Book of Mormon, um, and that's that's my next book. Okay. I have I have years of research, that, I, and I've presented on it a number of times, but I'm trying to bring it all together for, for a book. Well, soon. I know it was 15 years between uh, Ma Massacre at Mountain Meadows and Vengeance is Mine. I hope it's, it's less than 15 years. Yeah, I hope so too. It, it shouldn't, shouldn't take me that long, but we'll see. But you never know. <laughs> Although I guess they got the, the two volumes, the red volumes that you participated yeah, in. Yeah, those, the those did. Initially, they were going to wait on the legal volumes until Vengeance is Mine came out, and I'm glad that Rick gave that up at some point because yeah. it, it wouldn't be out till now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else we're missing? No, nope. that's good. All right. Well, everybody, go out and buy Convicting the Mormons. Uh, for one thing, it's shorter than Vengeance is Mine. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. That was why I read it first, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'll be able to finish that one first. So yeah. uh, fantastic book. Um, and I really appreciate you for being here on Gospel Tangents, Dr. Janice No Thompson. problem. <laughs> Lovely to be here. Thanks, Rick. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Janice Johnson. Janice, thank you so much for sitting down with me and sharing your expertise. Um, it's a fantastic book. Like I said, I read it first. It's shorter than uh, Vengeance is Mine, so that's a big plus. In our next conversation, I'd, I'm excited to introduce a prophet, Terry Patience, from the Remnant Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, based in Independence, Missouri. So they just had a little bit of a secession crisis following the death of the previous pro prophet, Fred Larson. So you were just a <laughs> just regular run-of-the-mill apostle? Yeah, and not, just a not run the of, president or No, anything? not the president of the quorum. Okay. Fred appointed you to be the, the new prophet, is that it? Yes. Um, while Fred was in his last days, he was unfortunately hospitalized. And he had uh, a visitor, two visitors come to him. Carl Van Cannon came to his room one day, and Kevin Romer, and we talked a little he's bit about He's the presiding Kevin. bishop. He's, he's our presiding bishop. He dictated, so he dictated a letter in his hospital room. In his hospital room. We have a videotape of that event. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, you can hear the audio only at patreon.com slash gospel tangents. For just $5 a month, you can hear the entire interview with no interruptions. If you want to watch the entire video for just $8 a month, you can also sign up at Patreon or on youtube.com slash gospel tangents and just subscribe here. You can watch the entire video uncut before everybody else. Also, if you'd like to continue to support Gospel Tangents, you can either sign up for our $10 or $20 memberships, or you can get some cool gear like this hat. Um, I've got the coffee mugs like this here. 
Uh, we've got sweatshirts and t-shirts and I'm even thinking about ties. Somebody said they wanted a tie. So I'll see if I can get that on my store. So go to gospeltangents.com store and you can get some Gospel Tangents gear. So you don't want to miss that. So anyway, thanks for listening. If you'd like to check out some of our other videos, check out here.